Uh, High Representative Mogherini, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm David Friedberg, as most of you know, the director of the Italian Academy for Advanced Studies here at Columbia. And I'm really delighted to have with us this afternoon High Representative Federica Mogherini, who is the High Representative of the European Union for Foreign Affairs and, and Security Policy. We should not forget that these days. And is also a Vice President of the European Commission. Io sono personalmente, noi siamo personalmente molto lieti perché essendo qui all'Italian Academy abbiamo provato per anni per invitare la uh, alta rappresentante, Mo, rappresentante uh, Mogherini per visitarci. Prima era ministro degli esteri italiano and um, we really tried to get her here and I'm very grateful to the European Institute for finally having succeeded in bringing you here today. Um, it's a critical time, as we know, not only for Europe, but also for the world. So I'm even more pleased that High Representative Mogherini has taken some time from her extraordinarily busy schedule to come and see us here at Columbia. I think, as most of you know, as the EU rep High Representative, um, uh, Ms. Mogherini played a major role in the negotiation and signing of the nuclear agreement with Iran in July of last year. This is the part of the notes which was prepared for me by um, François de Carrel of the European Institute, and of course we know about that, but there are so many other things as we read in the press which um, High Representative Mogherini is involved in leading, taking extraordinarily tough both political and moral decisions. I think one of the things that I've always appreciated about High Representative Mogherini is the way in which the political decisions are never left unattended by the moral consequences of the actions that she is obliged to execute under pressure of all extraordinary kinds. So our admiration goes out to you for managing to sustain such a complicated task in such extraordinarily difficult times. Um, the, uh, uh, Federico Mogherini has also been closely involved in devising and implementing Europe's response to the many crises which currently face the continent and the world. And I, as some of you may know, um, being the director as well of a German institute which transferred to London in 1933, the Warburg Institute, we, of course, I was there on the uh, 26th of June when Britain made what seemed to me the terrible decision to leave the uh, the EU. We in the academic world are suffering and very perplexed about the future. I myself have a staff and uh, and uh, uh, staff and a lot of students. The majority of students come from Europe, so we are facing European issues. Now, both here, the consequences of European issues, because obviously Europe, issues around Syria, for example, you know, impact American policy extraordinarily. So here, we have, have find the European um, community right at the center of world issues and world crises. I am sure that representative, High Representative Mogherini will play an extraordinary role in resolving them. She today will present to us, not quite done yet, she will present to us the new global strategy for the Union's foreign and security policy, a strategy which she has just released this summer. Um, I'm extraordinarily grateful to you for being with us today. We are much looking forward to hearing your thoughts about these challenges facing the Union. Um, but I'm also delighted today to introduce Professor Jack Snyder, an old friend who is the friend of personal friend, a friend of the Academy, always present at our events. He is the Robert and Renee Belfer Professor of International Relations in the Department of Political Science and the Salzman Institute of War and Peace Studies at Columbia. I'm not going to go through all the books because we really want to hear all professors are supposed to publish books. He's got tenure at Columbia, he's known all over the world, so we assume they're at the top of the tree. We want to hear the high representative, but Professor um, can't imagine a better person than Professor Snyder to moderate this discussion. So before closing, I just want to thank the many co-sponsors who have joined the European Institute and the Italian Academy in organizing this event, the Alliance Program, the Italian Cultural Institute, the Istituto Italiano di Cultura, come voi sapete, and the European Union's Getting to Know Europe Program. 
So now, without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to our very welcome guest, who will present the new EU Global Strategy. Join me in welcoming High Representative Mogherini. Thank you. Even if uh, such a, a warm and even Italian welcome uh, would encourage me to speak in Italian, but I guess uh, that is not foreseen, and, uh, uh, and then I would have to rewrite my speech completely. So, uh, first of all, uh, Professor uh, uh, Friedberg, Professor Schneider, uh, friends, uh, let me uh, tell you that it's really a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, finally, we've made it. Uh, we've tried uh, for a long time. Uh, maybe it's the European Union managing where uh, Italy is not. <laughs> Uh, but for me, it's really a pleasure to be here at the Italian Academy, uh, one of the most prestigious centers for Italian studies in the U.S. After such a full week here in New York at the U.N., it feels very much like being uh, back home. Uh, and I say it for real, because uh, just today someone was telling me, so you're going back home. No, I'll be going back to Brussels, which is not exactly the same for someone that is born in Rome, but uh, I guess you understand that. So here, I really feel uh, I am not only among friends, but also uh, I'm somehow uh, a bit back home. And it is a pleasure to be hosted by the European Institute at Colombia, the most ancient academic institution for European studies here in the United States. I know, I've been told, the European Institute was founded in 1948, correct? You know? Yes. <laughs> Before you ask me the questions, I, I, I ask you some. Uh, and that is exactly the same time when the Marshall Plan was being set up. Back then, Europe's economy was devastated by the war, and the United States came to our help. Today, despite the financial crisis, the European Union and the United States are the two biggest economies in the world. And I believe, in today's world, our transatlantic bond is even more crucial than it used to be back in 1948. This is about global politics, for sure, and we'll get there, but it's also something else, something deeper, something that goes to the core of our societies. Of course, at first look, apart from this island of Italy and Europe, Europe and America seem quite different. The cities are different, even the cars, the food, the electoral campaigns, even if when I get to the electoral campaigns, I have my doubts, it's so different. But jokes apart, the challenges we face today, the challenges our societies, our people face today, are very similar. I'm sure most of you have uh, listened uh, or read President Obama's speech uh, at the UN a few days ago. Whenever he mentioned a major challenge for our liberal democracies, he made clear he was talking about both America and Europe. That was the case when we talked about our politics and solutions that are too often imposed from top down and not agreed from the bottom up. That was the case when he talked about radicalization in our societies. That was the case when uh, he talked about the forces that are protesting against diversity and fostering hatred against whoever is perceived as different while well, the truth is that we are all different. And whenever he mentioned one of these challenges, he talked about Europe and America alike. I would like to say Europe and America together. I know you expect me to talk about Brexit and uh, refugee crisis, and I won't hide. I will not deny Europe faces its own specific problems, and I'm sure we come back to that not only in a moment, but also uh, in our questions, and hopefully also in my answers. But let me be very clear on this. Europe's problem is not the refugee crisis. Against the background uh, of the economic crisis and international stability, instability, there's this constant temptation we all face, not only in Europe, also here, to look for a scapegoat. Some forces blame the migrants, some blame whoever has a different look or speaks a different language, prays in a different way. Some blame the European Union, and in most cases, 
actually we find people that blame all of that together, migrants, minorities, and Europe at the same time. They look for a scapegoat. That's understandable. But this is an alternative to looking for real solutions. It's easier. It's much easier to uh, put the blame on something rather than focusing on what kind of solutions we can find. But this is a path that leads nowhere, and we're seeing it every day. Now, for sure, I don't have all the solutions. I actually think nobody does. But I know for sure that simplification, but also nationalism or isolationism are not the answer. They are rather illusions behind which some try to hide the lack of answers. Because again, it's easier. The truth is, our world is terribly complicated, terribly complex, as you have said, Professor. It is true that in a more globalized world, the old nation states have lost much of their sovereignty. The only way to regain this sovereignty is by sharing sovereignty in the world of today. The only way to find our strength is to share our strength with others in a sense of partnership. This is true for Europe, and this is why so many countries, so many people decided to join in a union. But this is also true for the international community. But let me focus on Europe first. I believe Brexit, when it will actually happen, because at the moment is the result of a referendum, when it will happen, it will be bad news for the European Union, indeed. I think it will be bad news also here or elsewhere in the world. But let me stress, I think it will be terrible news for Britain. We're focusing a little bit too little on this. Let's not forget who we are. Let's not forget what the European Union is, why it started, why we still need it, and what Britain is deciding to leave behind. We are part, as the European Union, of the world G3 in economic terms. We are the first trade partner and the first foreign investor in all parts of the world, none excluded. We are the main humanitarian donor worldwide, and actually the European Union alone invests more than the rest of the world combined. We have a world-class diplomatic network. Some of them are here in the room accompanying me. We are increasingly active as a global security provider, and we see that this is very much needed in the world of today. This doesn't mean that our European Union is perfect, far from that, but it means that our potential is much bigger than what we realize inside the Union. And no one of our member states, and actually I believe no one of the countries in the world, probably including this one, not even the strongest, the biggest, has the same potential alone than the European Union United. It's a matter of size, it's a matter of history, it's a matter of politics, it's a matter of projection. But it's also true that if you don't realize what your strength is, you don't use it. So the great challenge for us, and the only way to address also our citizens' needs, is making full use of this potential. Seeing it and using it. This is the reason why at the beginning of my mandate, almost two years ago, not yet, but getting close, I decided to set up the work towards a global strategy of um, our foreign and security policy. Uh, the last one was the uh, well-known uh, Solana strategy uh, back in 2003, and the world was completely different. It started by saying that the, uh, Europe was uh, uh, living in a world that was never so prosperous, safe. Life has changed, but also Europe has changed. Uh, we are many more now, and we are stronger now. So my idea back then was to engage in a continent-wide, European-wide conversation on our foreign and security policy and its priorities. And we engaged over one year and some months with national governments, different parts of it, not only the foreign ministries, but also defense, development, trade, but also culture and economy, uh, but also with uh, parliaments, academia, with the defense community of the European Union and the NGOs, and also with many students like you are here in this room. And when we agreed on the objectives 
of our external actions, we then looked into the tools we have at our disposals. What we have and what we should have, what works and what could work better, and in certain cases much better. So we started before the Brexit referendum was even scheduled. But our work became even more relevant after the referendum in the UK. Our best response, that was my, one of the responsibilities uh, I took, um, mm, that was to, to go on with the uh, release of the strategy. Uh, and that was actually happening a couple of days after the result of the referendum. Many were advising me not to go there exactly in that moment. But I thought that our best response to their vote was and is to make our union deliver on our citizens' need and to make it clear what is the next phase, what is the next stage. The best response we can have is to bring the European Union to the next level, into the future, as our grandfathers and our grandmothers managed to do back in 48, around that time, looking forward rather than backwards, even if they were living one of the darkest pages of the European history that, though, is full of dark pages. They managed to look into the future and build something that was visionary at that time, believing in the strength of their hopes. So, looking at our future, now the strategy is ready. It will not remain in a drawer. It was written together with a number of academics, but it is not an academic paper. It's a policy. When we choose the headline, uh, and we did it as it's, I think, always done. I've never written a book, but I guess that is the case. You do it when the work is completed, right? More or less. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I will never write a book. <laughs> um, or at least not decided the headline. But in this case, I did. Uh, and uh, I will always remember that moment. It was exactly the same day when uh, the results of the referendum came out and we were together with some uh, colleagues uh, in, in my office in Brussels, because sometimes I'm also in Brussels, and, uh, and we thought that uh, we had to identify clearly that we were not only presenting a common vision, a shared vision, but also an indication how to turn this vision into action and to make our union and our policy tools deliver for our citizens. So just before I came to New York, uh, and that's already one week, I presented our member states with concrete options to implement the strategy. Next March, uh, you might uh, know here, our union is celebrating its uh, 60th anniversary, the birthday of the European Union, the anniversary of the Treaty of Rome. So together with the celebrations that will be there, we must also come with a present to all our citizens and also for our partners in the world that will be celebrating with us and I think will also expect from the European Union a reaction in concrete terms. So some concrete steps to make our union stronger is the present I'm preparing for that time. One of these steps will concern our common security and defense. You might wonder why starting with defense. Those of you who are taking history classes Many? Many? Bashai? <laughs> None? <laughs> anyway, you uh, might know part of the answer to that question. Because the founding fathers and mothers, there were a few, but there were still some around, uh, of our European Union believed that the United Europe had to be built on two pillars, the European economic community and a defense community. It was an ambitious idea maybe too ambitious and visionary for that time, and the European defense community never saw the light. But our founding fathers and mothers knew that a true union couldn't simply rely on the integration of the markets. And we see it today. So, some of you might say, but that was in the 50s, in the middle of the Cold War. True, the world has changed, but let me tell you that a Europe of defense is probably much more needed and urgent in the world of today than back then. Because in a multipolar world like ours, and in a messy, if you allow me the terminology that is not properly <laughs> academic, but uh, it's, it's clear, in a messy world like ours, peace can only be the result of a collective effort. And it's time 
for Europe to do its part at full. As Obama said at the United Nations, again, international cooperation can only be, I quote, rooted in the rights and responsibilities of nations. So freedom comes with responsibility. This is something uh, that here in the United States is clear and also in, in Europe. Power comes with responsibility. And we, the European Union, cannot hide from our responsibilities. We are not in the 50s. So America deserves and needs strong partners. So a stronger European Union is no alternative to NATO, but on the contrary, a strong European Union can and will make NATO stronger. And at the same time, the entire world, the rest of the world, that has not connections with NATO, is asking for Europe, day by day, to be a global security provider more and more. Our military and civilian missions, and we have 17 of them right now, are already now supporting peace and stability in several parts of the world, especially in Africa. And many of our partners in Africa, in Asia, and in our region are asking for a greater European engagement to build capabilities, to train security forces, to accompany reconciliation processes, to do it the European way. And none of our member states has the force, the strength, nor the resources to address these requests alone. And I see that there is a growing consensus among our member states in Europe on the need for a Europe of defence. Let me just mention one figure. In Europe, we currently invest 50% of the US budget for defence. Yet, what we achieve is 15, 15% of the output. A more integrated European defence industry is the only way to close this gap, not just the gap in investment, but first and foremost, the gap in output, which is what counts. Every now and then, I uh, get asked whether Europe shouldn't focus on its soft power, rather, or only. And I come from the left, my political background is that one, comes natural for me to focus first and foremost on the soft power of Europe. But being a, an exclusively civilian power today is not enough doesn't work. It wouldn't be possible. Why? I know you have a class here on the history of soft power, so I will be very careful on what I say. But I believe that in today's world, soft power and hard power can only go hand in hand. And we see it in the reality, on the ground. I'll give you a very concrete example. In the last few weeks and months, several areas in the north of Nigeria are being liberated from Boko Haram. So refugees are going back to their homes. Humanitarian convoys are finally reaching regions that were cut off for years. And yet, in recent weeks, several trucks have been attacked by the terrorists. So many humanitarian organizations, rightly so, are refusing to enter central areas where the security situation is too unstable. Without real security, humanitarian aid can do very little or cannot even reach the ground. So a purely civilian power will need to rely on someone else, hard power, to fulfill its mission. We can develop both powers at the same time, and again, doing it the European way, which is, here I can say that, probably not outside the smart way. So in a complex world, like today's world, with a complex challenge, we need to mobilize all our tools towards our goals. Development calls for security. Security comes only with development. And we need to use all our policies, all our tools, in a coherent, consistent, coordinated, and even creative manner. Take our work on migration. I often wonder if there is anyone that really believes that building a wall is a real solution. We are, I, I, I don't want an answer. <laughs> I'd better not get an answer. <laughs> not here and not in the, in the European Union. But because, you know, no matter how many walls we would build, first of all, we would start building walls in every single country we are in. And at the end of the day, those who are inside the walls, as much as those that are outside of the walls, 
would be simply imprisoned by a multiple row of walls that would make very little sense. So, walls apart. What we're trying to do, finally, is trying to mobilize our different strands of action. Development aid, as well as a new, very ambitious investment plan for Africa and the Mediterranean, up to 44 billion euros, which makes more or less 50 billion dollars, to bring private investments uh, in countries that are fragile. We have EU military naval operation in the Mediterranean, saving hundreds of thousands of lives. I think we are above 400,000 lives we saved in this last year. And arresting the smugglers of human beings, while we have also started to train the Libyan Coast Guards and Navy to do the same. The first time I went to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in my current capacity, I went to Ag Agadez in the north of Niger. And I often uh, make this example. Many people, especially young people and, and women, when I landed there in an airport that used to be uh, an airport open for tourism and now it's, it's only for humanitarian aid and a few state visits, very, very few, uh, many people told me we used to make a living from tourism, then war and desertification came and now our youth has no other chance. And so there's the smugglers business, there's the terrorist or criminal organizations. So if we want to bring security back to that region, to that village, city, to our communities and to the world, the only way is to invest in sustainable development, which is as important as military capabilities. And I will quote President Obama at the United Nations one last time, I promise. I know you hear him all the time, but we don't, so it's... <laughs> for the same, I quote, for the small fraction of what we spent at war in Iraq, and he refers to the United States, we could support institutions so that fragile states don't collapse in the first place and invest in emerging economies that become markets for our own goods. So it's not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. Finish the quote. So with serious investment on the economy, on good jobs and on good governance, it is possible to prevent a new conflict or to stabilize a country. And this is the way we've chosen to follow. And this is the second area where the implementation of the global strategy will be crucial. As the first donor worldwide, the first foreign investor, and the first trade partner for most countries in the world, Europe is the player, the player, that can make a real difference in all these areas. But we need to make sure that all our policies are synchronized. And we know well, this is not always the case today. We know it, we're working on that. A strategy uh, has to be truthful and indicate the way for change. Moreover, we must never forget that Europe means much more than the European institutions or national governments. And here, let me stress one point. Sometimes you see, you, see, you read, you hear uh, national capitals in European countries referring to Brussels as something far away. So it's Berlin, Brussels. I cannot make the example of London anymore. Paris, Brussels. I cannot make the example of Rome because it's my own country. Uh, whatever, national capitals versus the capital of the European Union. The only ones that cannot make this exercise are the Belgians. But uh, there is no distance, there is no difference between our member states and our European institutions. The European Union does not exist without our member states. Our member states that are part of the European Union do not have a European Union if they do not have European institutions. This should be basic knowledge, at least in the European Union. But our private firms, the private investments that they can raise, the, all that is there beyond the public sector, being it institutions at national or European level, that is also a crucial player in our foreign policy. As well as it is the case for European NGOs and civil society organizations that are an integral part of our network. And if we don't manage, if we don't focus on how we work together, institutions, private sector, civil society, we lose a great opportunity. I believe there is no other way to foreign policy in this century. With uh, need uh, partners at all level of government and beyond the public sector, for instance, we are creating migration compacts with key countries and on a global scale. Just here in New York this week, 
we uh, launched this global compact for managing migration flows. But we need to strengthen at the same time regional organizations engaging with mayors, local actors, but also social movements and community leaders. But let me conclude, and I know I have been very long, I apologize. Let me conclude with some hope in this uh, complicated, messy world. A new world order struggles to emerge. We've lived different waves of uh, analysis on where we were on the world order. I will not enter there. But uh, even here in this ministerial week at the General Assembly, we've seen it very clear. Because in spite of all our efforts, all our work, all our meetings, to find cooperative solutions to put an end to crisis in Syria or in the Middle East at large, between Israel and Palestine or in Libya, the path towards peace is dramatically full of twists and turns. There's little hope and a lot of frustration. And we have a responsibility to preserve the role of international institutions and the role and the value of diplomacy. So let me focus on some good news, good news that keep us hoping and keep us investing in multilateralism and diplomacy. On the international arena, we have achieved global deals that used to seem impossible just here last year. The Sustainable Development Goals, in Paris, the agreement on climate change. In a couple of days, Monday, President Santos in Cartagena, in Colombia, will sign a deal with the FARC, ending a war that has lasted over 50 years. And I was particularly honored to receive from him, from his own hands, here in New York this week, the text of the agreement he will be signing on Monday in Cartagena. And just yesterday, another good story. Uh, you remember that. Uh, I chaired a ministerial meeting of the E3 plus 3 together with Iran. So US, Russia, China, UK, France, Germany, and Iran to assess the implementation of the Iran deal. And we could share all together, Lavrov sitting next to Kerry and uh, all of us together, that the deal is being implemented at full and also to share our common determination as a group to continue to make it work together. The very same countries, the very same ministers, that on other files, in the same hours, have quite some difficulties to agree on basic steps, and I put it mildly. Moving east, another good story. Look at Myanmar. 15 years ago, Aung San Suu Kyi couldn't travel to Oslo to receive a Nobel Prize. And today, in New York, at the General Assembly, she represents her country. Moving south, despite all difficulties, Africa is getting stronger. The world united to defeat Ebola that two general assemblies ago seemed to be an impossible challenge to tackle. And we made it. Children mortality is still tragically high, but it has been reduced by 40% in 20 years. The fight against malaria has cut by half the number of infections in just one decade. Whenever I travel around the world, I meet so many young people just like you, full of energy and hope and determination. I know not all of the young people in the world share that. And there's a lot of despair, frustration, and a sense of not being useful in their own societies. But I see the strength of the young Africans looking for a better opportunity. I see the incredible passion of the Arab youth that is not only the radicalized youth, but it's also the youth that is fighting for democracy and for human rights and for more inclusive societies, including the girls in the Arab societies. And in our own societies, in America and in Europe, I see so many people willing to engage and to do something good for their communities and for the entire world. So in all the success stories I mentioned, our European Union has played is playing and will continue to play its part as a donor, as a diplomatic power, as a security provider. And we can be a force for good. Sometimes some, we need someone else from the outside to remind us. But uh, whenever we have a mirror in front of us, we see it. We are already and we can become an even stronger power for good. 
So there is no other way to address our citizens' needs and to support our partners than working on our strengths and our unity. Against fake solutions, we can only oppose the strength of effective solutions to make a real difference. It's not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. And it is something we can only do together as a true European Union with unity inside Europe, but also unity across the Atlantic, today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks for those very thoughtful comments. I have the privilege of asking uh, the first question before we throw it open to the audience. And I'd like to ask you to reflect on your experiences that you had uh, before you developed the new strategy document, which included your very impressive work in negotiating the nuclear deal with Iran, which uh, gave you experience in dealing with uh, a big country that is a geopolitical rival of the West, uh, that doesn't necessarily always follow Western rules in its foreign relations. And I I'm wondering what lessons you took away from that experience that helped guide you in thinking about strategies for dealing with other big countries that don't necessarily always follow our rules. Well, thank you for the question, because uh, uh, to me this is the, really the, guide on, the guiding principle I'm trying to follow. Um, and I was thinking about that yesterday, chairing that ministerial meeting that was a bit surreal. I mean, the meeting itself was very good, but then we moved to a Syrian one that was a little bit less constructive. But uh, first of all, uh, yes, indeed, I experienced a lot of negotiations uh, in that year, year and, uh, and something. But I want to recognize and acknowledge the fact that this has been a very long process on which many much more talented and experienced diplomats and, and politicians than me have put their efforts. Uh, and this is a result really uh, of a long, long process. But what I have learned um, and what I've shared with my colleagues uh, last uh, well, July last year was that no matter how difficult an issue can be and no matter how much of mistrust not only was there before negotiations but is there still because we solved the nuclear issues, but all the others are still complicated issues. No matter how difficult this is, if there is a common will, a common determination to solve through dialogue and diplomacy a specific issue, you get there. And I never doubted and I never saw a lack of political will in that room, even in the most difficult moments. And my take is that whenever there is political will to solve the most difficult crisis, conflicts, problems in the world, and uh, indeed the United States and Iran had not talked to each other for, what, 40 years or something, 37? Uh, so not easy at all, but no matter how difficult it is, if there is political will, determination, and what we would call patience, uh, you get there. And this can be the source of inspiration of our work also in other situations. Because, you know, uh, last year, before we uh, managed to get the deal, every single day we were reading in the newspapers, uh, seeing on TV, plenty of people doubting that the agreement was possible, and we made it. Then we heard that the agreement was not implementable, and we implemented it. Then, we heard that, yes, the implementation started, but it would have never been completed. And today, after seven months of implementation, we can say it's well on track. So it's possible. My take is that, yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, let me see if there are questions from uh, the audience. Yes, please, there, there's a microphone and we'll come around. And say who you are, please. Hi, Commissioner. Thank you very much for this inspiring speech, first of all. I'm a student at the Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. And um, you stressed during your talk that what we need to ensure is to make the union deliver on citizens' needs. 
So I'd be interested to know how we ensure that the global strategy will particularly cater to the needs and concerns of those citizens that currently feel left out and feel that they haven't benefited from the union as much as they should. Yeah, uh, I think this is exactly one of the key points uh, of our common work uh, inside Europe, but also here in the United States. Now, the strategy doesn't cover the work you have to do here, uh, here at home, but um, the key point to me is that in the strategy we identify sectors where so far we have not used collectively our power to uh, invest in the economic growth uh, and the job creation inside Europe. Uh, so we have decided to focus on uh, uh, opening up new channels that are not new for, mem for national countries, I mean for countries, for nations, but are new for the European Union, new channels of uh, diplomatic work or external work, like uh, the economic diplomacy, uh, the work on uh, uh, facilitating investments of European uh, businesses and firms outside of the European Union, or the development of the trade agreements that I know are extremely controversial, so both sides of the Atlantic. I don't want to enter into this debate here, but uh, uh, to use our uh, external projection also for um, the economic uh, growth of the continent. Indeed, there is another step that needs to be taken. That is, how do we make sure that inside the European Union and inside every single country, the benefits of uh, an increased economic growth is distributed among the citizens. Uh, I'm afraid this is not in my uh, portfolio and probably out of reach uh, for me, but politically, I can add, even if it's not my institutional uh, responsibility, I'm convinced that we, will not, uh, we, will, we cannot focus only on the launch of the European Union integration process in the fields of defense or foreign policy, but we also need to relaunch the union and the integration process on the economic policies. Again, this is not for me to, to do it, to prepare it, to put forward proposals, but uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an European citizen, uh, even before then, then a politician, I believe that these two channels uh, can be in parallel uh, a field for uh, relaunching the European project and making it evident that it's only at the European Union level that we manage to deliver for our citizens. Because what our citizens ask, you see all the, uh, the polls are security, number one, and uh, jobs, number two. And I guess here it's very much the same. So it's the two fields where actually the European Union has an added value and we have a responsibility to deliver. I'm, do I'm trying to do my part of the job, but I think we need to do also the other one. Thank you. Uh, I'm British. I'm Simon Reich. I teach at Rutgers Newark, so I don't want to talk about Brexit. Uh, um, I have a question uh, about the actual report and the relationship between the report itself um, and, in fact, not just policy but operations. Um, you skipped over Operation Sophia um, uh, in the Mediterranean, um, and I want to I wanted to ask you how you reconcile a gap. The report talks about a global strategy, but in fact, if we look at the changing mandate of Operation Sophia over the last 12 to 14 months, um, it shifted clearly from being a search and rescue operation uh, to being an entirely different operation which is concerned with stopping smuggler flows. You, you did mention those. Um, I myself was fortunate enough to spend part of the summer in Brussels asking officials about Sorry it. Sorry for you. Yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> it, as an academic, it's the price we pay, right? But, but um, there seemed to be a lot of dis I apologize. There seems to be a lot of disagreement um, about the nature of the operation moving forward. And the Italians are still very interested in search and rescue, but a lot of the other member states are no longer interested in that. They're interested in stopping migrants. And that's inconsistent with the kind of global strategy that you laid out. So I wonder whether you could explain what I don't understand. I apologize for my long intervention. Uh, no, thank you very much for the question, because actually it's very useful for me to clarify this. Uh, first of all, uh, not only it would be inconsistent with the global strategy, it would be inconsistent with international law. Uh, so. 
let me clarify this very clearly. The mandate of Operation Sophia is not stopping migrants at sea. The mandate of Operation Sophia has been from the very beginning and continues to be the dismantling of the criminal networks that are smuggling people. And we have uh, arrested, or rather we have given to the Italian authorities uh, who are now uh, dealing with the judiciary uh, consequences of that, I think around 70 uh, suspect smugglers. We've seized uh, more than 100 uh, vessels. And as you probably know, together with that, we have saved uh, in total Operation Sophia, uh, operations, the other operations we're running in the Mediterranean, we've saved more than 400,000 people at sea. So the mandate has never been a search and rescue operation. The mandate has always been trying to dismantle the network of smugglers of human beings and traffickers. And in doing so, according to the law of the sea, saving the people that were on the boats that we encountered in the international waters. We operate only in international waters. So, saving lives, yes, and we continue. Dismantling the business uh, uh, network of the smugglers, yes, and we continue. We have added two mandates uh, recently, just uh, some couple of weeks ago, one week ago, I'm losing uh, the sense of time, but uh, we've added two new mandates uh, that I believe are going to make it uh, more effective, uh, even if, as I said, uh, we've reached already some good results. Uh, one is the training of the Libyan Coast Guard and Navy. This is something that the Libyan authorities have requested us, and this would allow the Libyan uh, Coast Guard to operate in the Libyan territorial waters without us being in the territorial waters of Libya, would stop in the international waters, unless requested to do so, to um, save lives and, uh, and uh, seize the vessels and, uh, and uh, bring to justice the, the smugglers in the Libyan territorial waters, because now people at sea, in the high seas, are saved, but we see more and more people dying in the territorial waters of Libya, where we cannot enter. Uh, we have a mandate from the UN Security Council uh, we have a mandate to operate in international waters. So first, we are doing the training of the Coast Guards, which will also have another uh, impact on Libya, a positive one, because controlling the security of the territorial waters of Libya will also allow the maritime economic activities uh, of the coast of Libya to restart fully the fishery. Uh, so it's a plus, it's a win-win. The second additional task, a mandate uh, we have uh, added, is uh, uh, we've been requested to do so by the Security Council with a resolution to contribute to the implementation of the arms embargo that the Security Council um, uh, introduced on, uh, on arms uh, uh, getting to Libya. Uh, we have uh, uh, started uh, uh, doing what we can uh, in that sector, so we will contribute as far as we can uh, to implement a UN Security Council resolution uh, in that respect, but this stays as, a, as an additional and not central tasking uh, that the operation has. I hope I've been clear. Thanks. And by the way, if I can uh, add, I'm sorry, uh, it's an operation that uh, um, counts on uh, the uh, contribution of 24 member states operating on the EU flag, and it's one of the things I'm proud of, because when we started, uh, with the idea and the political decision, everybody told me it is absolutely impossible to put in place uh, a complex operation like this uh, within a month. That was what I requested. They, everybody told me it's going to take minimum one year, so better not even to start because it's going to be too late. We did it in one month. This also to say that when we have clear objectives, unity of purpose and determination, even the European Union and even a military operation of the European Union can be very quick. So, sorry to say, but I'm under orders for a hard stop at two o'clock. Uh, so, we have to bring this to a close. And, oh, well, in that case, if, if, if you're willing. Yes, uh, Mr. Ambassador. <coughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> My name is Valerie Kuczynski. I teach at Columbia University. And my question is, uh, what do you see the future of the European Union sanctions against Russia for its aggression in Ukraine? Is it... Uh, I knew I had to stop. 
<coughs> well, I wish I could, but uh, the thing is that relationship with the implementation of the Minsk Accords, which is the position of the European Union, does not to be uh, relevant enough because the Minsk Accord are not doable. The implementation cannot be achieved, as is, I mean, obvious now. And this is the first part of the question, and then what are you going to do with the growing demands of some of the European Union members to lift the sanctions altogether? And the third, how do you see your relationship with Russia? Thank you. So we have another hour, right? <laughs> uh, first, uh, I uh, stick to what our uh, Russian friends, our Ukrainian friends, our French and German friends tell us, uh, even in these days, uh, that the Minsk implementation is possible. Uh, this is their assessment. This is an assessment that uh, uh, we share. And uh, so many times we've thought that things were not possible and then they turned out to be possible. Uh, so the key point for me is how can the European Union help more for achieving the implementation of Minsk? Because we always focus on the sanctions and I give you a news, the European unity was not only built, but also maintained over the last two years. And we just recently uh, decided uh, a rollover of the sanctions on individual sanctions uh, a few days ago by unanimity. So it's true, there are different views about that, but then the decision comes always unanimous. So there is unity in that respect inside the European Union. And it, I think we'll continue to be unity. Uh, to me, the, 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 the marvelous thing about Europe is not that we have a united and univocal vision of things, but that out of our diversity of opinions and experiences, we managed to come out with a united decision. That is what counts for me. So I hate when we say that we have to speak with one voice. It's great that we have different voices. The only thing that counts is that we pass the same messages, we sing the same song, uh, but it's good to have different voices. Uh, it's our richness, as it is the case in the United States. Uh, so the uh, next European Council in October will have a discussion, heads of state and government level, uh, on the state of play of the implementation of the agreements in Minsk. Uh, I've prepared that uh, conversation uh, together with all the foreign ministers, so we will present our input to that discussion. Uh, and uh, um, I believe that the key point will be how we will manage to help more implement the agreements, including in, uh, in Kiev. And we have discussions in these days, also here in New York, about additional things that European Union can do to uh, encourage the implementation. The future of our relations with Russia, but also the present of our relations with Russia, uh, is not only the sanctions. Uh, I just had, uh, what was that, yesterday or the day before yesterday, uh, one hour meeting tete-a-tete uh, -tete with Lavrov where we discussed so many issues, not only the bilateral issues, not only the situation in Ukraine, that is also the core, always the core of our conversation, but we discussed at length Syria, not necessarily easier than Ukraine in this moment uh, to discuss in that format, uh, but the common work we do, for instance, on the Middle East peace process or on Libya or on counterterrorism or other issues. Uh, so our relations with Russia are uh, not uh, limited to uh, the sanction issue. Uh, we have a common European Union position uh, that uh, foresees several different principles, including the principle that we called of selective engagement on the fields where we see a European interest that might coincide uh, with the valuation of the Russian interest. It's not for us to define which areas Russian Federation is interested to, to discuss with us, we leave it to Moscow, but for our uh, side there are fields where we see, especially foreign policy and regional issues, where we see an interest we have in uh, working or engaging with, with Russia. Uh, on the annexation of Crimea, uh, our position, uh, I'm 100% sure, will always stay the same, of non-recognition. Uh, that is a matter of uh, not only principle, uh, but also uh, avoiding creating a precedent. It is extremely painful for any European, and any European that is in this room, I think, uh, feels the same, that in this century, uh, borders can be changed by the use of force in Europe. Uh, this is simply not acceptable for any European. So on the annexation of Crimea, for sure, uh, there will be no change in the European Union position. Thank you so much. It's been an honor as well as a pleasure to listen to you.